that last slide of heaven. I, I like to think of the first 60 seconds in heaven. Your loved ones walk through those gates. Folks, I want to tell you something. When they walk through those gates, first 60, imagine the first 60 seconds. Probably loved ones there to greet them that have gone on before, waiting for them. They looked over at glory and they said, I don't deserve this. And they knew immediately that they did not get there by their own good works, but it was by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's the gift of God. And I believe that they saw Jesus. They saw those nail scarred hands and they said, Thank you, Lord. And I believe they said something else. I believe that when they saw those nail scarred hands, they said, Lord, I want all my loved ones to come and be with me. They went through that portal because Jesus went to a cross for them. Today, we could say, as Hebrews 4 9 says, that they have entered into their rest. The Bible says there is a rest for the people of God. Now some of you came here today and you'd say, boy, I wish I had a rest from my troubles. I wish I had a rest from my pain. I wish I had a rest from my loneliness. I wish I had a rest from my frustration. Well, let me tell you something. There is a rest that's promised for you, just as it was promised to them. Today we're going to look at waiting on the Lord. Sometimes uh, we've got to just learn how to wait the right way for the fulfillments that God brings into our lives. As we gather today, let's pray for that. Join me in prayer, would you? Father in heaven, I thank you for those that have entered into our rest. And Father, David said, my soul has found rest in this life, in God and in God alone. Lord, we don't need more education. Lord, we don't need more medication. We don't need more diversions and counseling. What we need is Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, that today as we gather, for those that are looking for rest who are here with us today, that you'll be their rock and their fortress and their refuge, just as you were for these that have gone on. Be the one who leads us by the still water which they're enjoying. Give us green pastures again. Fill our cup to overflowing. And connect us right now with the living God for those things that are nibbling away at our souls. And Lord, let us walk from this place today knowing that we have found rest in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. My question for you today is this. How good are you at waiting? Oh, some of the, I know some of the guys here said, oh, I'm, I'm real good. I'm great at waiting. Really? Let me ask your wife. How good is he at waiting? <laughs> Let me ask the family. How good are, are they at waiting? Now, I've got to tell you something. I, I am the worst. I thought I'd hear an amen from my wife on that. But anyway, let me continue. I am not good at waiting. I hate being in, we invariably in the checkout line at the grocery store getting in the longest line every time. Anybody like that? I was in the doctor's office a couple of years ago. Had a 9 o'clock appointment. At about quarter to ten, they put me in a room, and I was sitting there 15 minutes when the back door of that, I heard the back door of the doctor's office open, and the doctor walks in, says, good morning, everyone. I hear him in the hallway. So wait a minute. I had a nine o'clock appointment. He doesn't show up till ten. I, I was tempted to send him a bill. <laughs> for my time. I was a little crazy in that room. Every now and then, your impatience will catch up with you. It did for Brenda uh, and me when we were vacationing in Warhead City a while back. 
My son was four, between four and five. And we got to Warhead City, got to a restaurant, and uh, the service was terrible. It was the worst service I guess we've ever had in a restaurant. And uh, I started complaining. They brought the food, took forever to bring the food out. They brought Brenda's and my son Josh's food out. Didn't bring me any food. <laughs> and I complained, this place is awful. This place is terrible. I've never come back to this place again. I can't believe that they'd serve y'all and not serve me. What in the world's going on? Well, about that time, the manager, who makes his regular manager make the round, how's your meal going, yada, yada, comes up to our table and says, how's it going? <laughs> Before I could say a word, my four-year-old son said, this is awful, this is the worst restaurant we got to do. <laughs> and he remarks on telling the manager everything I've been saying. <laughs> I was so embarrassed. It caught up with me. The manager had never been told off by four year old. He was so shaken that he said, Folks, y'all are eating for free today. He comped our meal. We didn't pay a cent for that meal. When we got back out of the car, I looked at my son and said, Son, you know what you just did? Next restaurant we go to, do it again. <laughs> But sometimes impatience catches up with us all. We are living in a time when America is infected with hurry sickness. Amen? Everybody's in a hurry. People are passing me on this interstate out here, and I wonder, where are they going? They're probably just going to home so fast that they put their feet up. We have hurry sickness in America. But let me tell you something. God's best gifts do not come in a hurry. God gave Joseph a dream. dream. Your brothers and sisters will, will bow down. Your brothers will bow down to you. You're going to save your family. But it was 20 years before it came through. God gave Abraham and Sarah a promise. You're going to have a son. But they couldn't wait. Look at the tragedy. God put Israel in his waiting room for 40 years in the wilderness. That was God's waiting room. He then put them 70 years in Babylon. That was his waiting room as well. When Jesus ascended in Acts chapter 1, before he left, the last words he said were, Go back to Jerusalem and wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it was several days before the Holy Spirit came, but they were called to wait patiently for the Holy Spirit. And by the way, Jesus said this, in the last days, people will say, well, where is the hope of his coming? He's not coming back. In Luke 12, it says, even Jesus said this, Luke 12, they will begin to beat their maid servants and eat and drink and, and forget the master's coming, but he will come in a day when they think not, cut them asunder, and appoint them their portion with the unbelievers because they couldn't wait. Folks, we've got to learn how to wait properly on the Lord. Let me tell you five things that waiting does for you. Why does God want us to wait on things sometimes? Sometimes we have to wait so that, number one, so that God can do his best work. That's why we wait. We've got to give God. Listen, while you're waiting, God is working. And that's true all the time. He was working while Joseph was in prison. He was working while Abraham and Sarah were waiting for a child. God's always working while you're waiting. Don't think he's not. I want to tell you a story. We had a couple who came to me in agony. Their son, grown son, in his 20s or 30s, had become an alcoholic, and he had created such grief. Lost job after job, alcoholism had eaten him alive. And I put this young man on my prayer list. I had a prayer list of lost people, and I prayed for him to be saved every day. God saved their... You wouldn't believe the agony this couple went through. After 
I retired, I was on Facebook, and I was friends with them on Facebook. They had posted a picture. This is years later. I'm just so glad I checked Facebook that day because the picture that they posted was a picture of the husband and wife in a baptistry wearing a white robe, and that son was in that baptistry too. And I want to tell you my heart leap because I remember the years and years and years and the tears. We prayed and we agonized. But I want to tell you something. God had a plan. And that boy got saved. And he got delivered. Let God do his best work. Waiting on God, number two, reminds us that he's in control. Put the second one up there. It reminds us that he's in control. When we wait properly, it says, God, I have faith in you that you're going to bring this to fulfillment. Listen, read the book of Acts. Peter was in prison, going to die the next day, and he was asleep. Remember? The angel had to come in and whack him to wake him up. I say whack him, he slapped him and said, get up. Listen, if I was dying the next day, I'd probably be awake, wouldn't you? He trusted the Lord's in control. He called, listen, waiting calls for faith. Number three, it builds our character. Waiting builds our character. Listen, waiting will show you where God wants to work in your life. It'll show where your life needs work. It sure will. Waiting tests your motives. It shows the purity of your heart. Listen, Judas could not wait. That's why he betrayed Jesus. I think he thought he was going to push the issue. And because he couldn't wait on Jesus to be who he was, he ended up losing his soul. But here's the one I like most. Waiting. Listen to this. Bill's anticipation. Look at that one. Uh, and appreciation. I, I like the anticipation better. Put that in there. It builds anticipation. Anticipation is one of the thrills of life. I can't wait to see these folks again, right? I bet you can't wait. And so as you wait properly, you know that day is coming. Listen, I can't wait for Christmas. We've already got Christmas Day planned, didn't you? We have. And I'm looking forward to Christmas Day. We're going to the movies. 1917 is coming out Christmas Day this year. We can't wait to see 1917, a movie of, of World War I. We can't wait. You see, many of the thrills of life come with anticipation. Now, I want to tell you today how to wait properly for what the Lord has for you. There's five things that I want you to learn about how to wait properly for what the Lord has for you. There's two scriptures to look at. Number one is Isaiah chapter, excuse me, Psalm chapter 40. David tells us the benefits of waiting properly. Look at what he said. He knew how to wait. David said, I waited patiently for the Lord. And look what happened. He had climbed his ear to me. He heard my cry. He brought me out of the horrible pit out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock and established my steps, and he's put a new song in my mouth. Wow. Because he knew how to wait from me. Now, Isaiah 40, verse 31, Isaiah tells us how to wait from me. Look at what Isaiah says. Those that wait upon the Lord, when God puts you in his waiting room, this is what you got to learn. With those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now right there he tells us how to wait on God. When God puts you in his waiting room, five things I want you to take note of. Number one, in God's waiting room, he expects you to wait pleasantly. That's important. You gotta wait pleasantly. Keep a, we sing a song. There's a sweet 
sweet spirit in this place. Have you heard that song? Why do you have to become sauerkraut while you're waiting? Why can't you wait with a sweet, sweet spirit? I was reading this week of a couple who said years ago they took their child to watch the filming of Sesame Street. How many watch Sesame Street when you're young? All right. They had this big bird on there called what? Big bird. Big bird. Big Bird, that's what we're going to eat at Thanksgiving, Big Bird. <laughs> and they said that after all the kids left, all the little puppets, and they said the guy wearing the Big Bird outfit took the head off. And the, and, and the lady said, and my little boy saw it. And he said, in wonder, he said, he tugged his mom's dress and said, Mom, does Big Bird know there's a man inside of him? <laughs> <laughs> and I realized when I read that this week, I've got a man inside of me. Jesus Christ. When I gave my life to Christ, he came inside of me. And 2 Corinthians 2.15 says, we are to be the fragrance of So when I'm waiting, I've got to learn how to be the fragrance of Christ. And wherever you're impatient, you've got to think, I've got this, this is a calling to be the fragrance of Christ. I'm going to have to take that fragrance of Christ, put it on the dashboard of my car next time I drive around Fayetteville. And I want to lay down on the horn. I need to say, wait a minute. I'm going to be the fragrance of Christ. When somebody shows me their IQ out the window, I can say, I'm going to be the fragrance of Christ. How do y'all know what that means? <laughs> I've got to tell you this story in England. They tell the story of the conductor on the train. So they were pulling out of the station, and there were two ladies in one compartment, two ladies and a man in one compartment. And, and, and one lady wanted the window of the train down, the other one the window up, and they got into a fight, an argument. And uh, they called the conductor. One lady says, I want the window down. I'll suffocate if I can't breathe. Other lady said, if, you, if she lowers that window, I'll get pneumonia and die. So there was the argument. One's going to die if it's, uh, if it's open. One's going to die if it's closed. Doctor looked at the man and said, what do I do? The man said, it's very easy. He says, you close the window until she dies. You open the window until she dies. And then we have some peace on this track. You gotta have some wisdom. Have a sweet, sweet spirit. Where you are impatient, you gotta say, this is calling for me to practice being the fragrance of Christ. And just put that on your refrigerator this week. That's your refrigerator quote. As you walk out the door, am I going to be the am I the fragrance of Christ? Are people seeing him in me? I carry around inside of me a man, Jesus. Not only must you wait pleasantly, but number two, you need to wait prayerfully. When Jesus said, go back to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit, they went back and do you remember how they waited? They were in prayer. 120 were in prayer in one accord with the Holy Spirit. Psalm 40, David says, I waited patiently for the Lord. That's a prayer. Wait prayer for me. F.B. Byer, the famous evangelist, said, God's delays are not God's denials. And just because he's delaying giving you something doesn't mean he's denying giving you something. There's a reason for it. Now, Isaiah said something I want Baptists to hear. Those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength and mount up like eagles. I've pastored 42 years. I haven't seen many eagles, but I've seen a lot of chickens. <laughs> Most Baptists are more like chickens than eagles. 
My wife was raised on a chicken farm with 28,000 chickens. We know about chickens. Just the holy bird in our house. Bridge collapsed in Siloam, North Carolina, in Surrey County, near our home, with a chicken truck on it. Thousands of chicken died. And pastors mourned for months. We know about chickens. Chickens fly about six inches off the ground. If they fly at all, they flap their wings, kick up dust, always pecking each other or pecking the ground. And that's why I say more badness are chickens than eagles. He calls us here to rise above it like eagles. Turn to your neighbor and say, Are you a chicken or are you an eagle? Go ahead. When God puts you in his waiting room, he expects you to conduct yourself like an eagle above it. Did I hear you tell you about the wife that told, whose cell phone was had run out of power? She wanted to call her husband, her cell phone was out of energy, so she said her, her boy who had a cell phone said, call your dad, I need to talk to him on your cell phone. Boy pulled out his cell phone, dialed his dad, hung up, said, Mama, a woman answered. Oh boy, she was living. All day long, her mind, boy, when he gets home, I want to know who this woman is. I want to know why a woman answered his cell phone. I want to know what her mind was chewing on that, pecking it to death like a chicken. When he got home, she was so mad, she walked up and slapped him right in the face. Husband said, What's that for? She said, your son called you today and a woman at you. He said, what? He looked over at his son and said, son, a woman at you? He said, sure did, Dad. He said, what did she say? She said, the number you called is not functioning at this time. <laughs> I'll get later. We let chicken think. Heck and thinking. Raising my son, we used to say about my little boy, raising our son was like being pecked to death by chickens. <laughs> All the time. I'm going to tell you something. We've got to get in God's church, learn how to be eagles again, don't we? We've got to rise, and the way we rise up is, is by prayer. <clears throat> the apostles in Acts chapter 4, John and Peter were thrown in prison, and the church entered into prayer for them. And I had to think. If your pastor got thrown in prison today, what would you do? First thing you do is call a lawyer. Mount a protest. We'd have plaques and marches and demonstrations. That's not what the old church did. They were thrown in prison, prison and they entered into prayer. When you're waiting, it's time to be praying. In Acts 4.31 says, After they prayed, the place was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God boldly, because they rose above it in prayer. You're to wait prayer. You're to wait pleasantly. Number three, you're to wait purposely. <coughs> purposely. Text says, renew your strength. Those that wait upon the Lord renew their strength. You know what that means? Use that time to rebuild your spirit tank. How many of you have ever read Gary Chapman's book, The Five Love Languages, or heard of it? You ever heard of it? You're married, or getting married, read The Five Love Languages. Gary talks about that you've got a love tank. The people get divorced because they let their love tank run on empty. And he tells you how to keep your love tank full in marriage. I know a bunch of wives are going to buy that book for their husband today. You need to. It's a great book. But you've got a spirit type, too. Renew your strength. Get, keep your tank full. How do you fill your spirit tank? Not two ways. Determine to praise Him and determine to learn. Now, I want you to write this down. Instead of asking, why is this happening to me? Ask, 
what is this teaching me? You see, we walk around all the time saying, why does this happen to me, Pastor? I don't know why this is happening. Why did I lose my loved one? Why is this happening? Stop asking that question. Don't leave it with it. Start asking, what's God teaching me? What do I need to learn? We had been married a little over a year when I got sick in Guam for eight months. Oh, my goodness. I had to wait eight months to see my wife again. You know what I determined to do? I determined I was going to read ten chapters a day in the Bible. That's what I did. God, I want you to teach me something during this time. So I opened the Word and I read ten chapters every day. That, that's a pretty big bite to chew. What do you want to teach me in this? And then I praised him through that. You know, the eagle's level of praise. That's the purpose of waiting, to praise. Keep praising, keep learning. Put that as your purpose. Number four, in God's waiting room, then wait for nothing. Wait for nothing. Those that renew their strength shall not up a wings as eagles, and they shall walk, they'll do something. And not faint. Write this down. I'm going to determine that downtime is not wasted time. Downtime is not going to be wasted time with the Lord. I'm going to practice obedience and I'm going to practice service. I want to tell you how God works. Downtime, wait time is sometimes when He's sowing seeds. They can bless the budget. I was in the, uh, anybody heard of Elon University? Elon, up in, outside Burlington, Elon University. I pastored there for seven years at First Baptist Church. I started the Baptist Student Union at Elon College back then, that university. Now, when we started the Baptist Student Union, there were Baptists going to school there, as I'm sure there are at Methodist. Somebody's got to sanctify Methodist College. It's a Baptist. So uh, we started Baptist students to minister students. We had faithfully three or four students. That's all. First year, second year, third year, fourth year, three or four students. I was saying, boy, this isn't working. I was waiting for God to move. God wasn't moving. One day somebody said, Preacher, Baptists don't come to anything unless you feed them. <laughs> and suddenly an idea was birthed. I contacted WMU in the association. Every church I contacted, WMU leaders said, Could you come and provide a meal for our Baptist student union? I want to tell you something. Those country ladies could bring some fried chicken and homemade pies and Cakes, and they loved on those kids. And I want to tell you something. A miracle happened. Three or four to 50, 60, 70. Every week we had home-cooked meals. We had them sitting on couches in a place where they had couches. And the kids, they showed up like crazy. It took about five years to get there, though, folks, for me to get smart enough to figure out what God was doing. Listen, while you're waiting, and ask God and look for what God is wanting to birth in you during that time. I stayed obedient and I stayed open to the Holy Spirit. And as far as I know, that Baptist Union Union is still there today, still feeding those kids. You see, you're not excused from serving while you're waiting. Serve while you wait. God will open the door. But here's the last one. Wait patiently. Those that wait upon the Lord shall walk and not faint. Wait patiently. Don't grow weary. Don't try to push it. Sometimes Baptists try to push things rather than be follow the Lord. I, I love the story of the three Boy Scouts who came to their scout leader one day. Said to their scout leader, we, we've done our good deeds. You know, they're supposed to do a good deed every day. Went to the scout leader and said, we've done our good thing for the day. Scout leader said, what was it? They said, we helped a little old lady across the street. 
scout leader said, why did it take three of them? The little boy said, because she really didn't want to go. <laughs> Portion. God will make a way if you wait patiently for the Lord. Write down these words, the Chinese bamboo tree. The Chinese bamboo tree is a miracle. The Chinese bamboo tree, they put the seed in the ground and fertilize it and water it, and for the first year, nothing happens. They fertilize it and water it the second year, nothing happens. Third year, nothing happens. Fourth year, nothing happens. But the fifth year that the Chinese bamboo shoot is in the ground, it can grow up to 90 feet in a year. If you're willing to wait, you'll reap that harvest. This church has to wait for a pastor. Will you wait pleasantly? Will you wait prayerfully? Will you wait purposefully and productively and patiently? Maybe God is waiting for you to make a move before he moves you out of his way. And maybe the move you need to make, you're in God's waiting room right now, and the move you need to make is, I need to confess Jesus as Savior and follow him in baptism. I've never done that. God's waiting on you. You want God to move? God's waiting on you to move. Maybe you're in God's waiting room because he's wanting you to make a commitment, to change your life, to repent of something that you know needs to be out of your life, to decide to serve. Maybe right now you need to make a commitment, to make a move in order for God to make his. God's waiting for the not bad place if you know how to handle it properly. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I can't wait to step through those pearly gates into glory and see Jesus. Paul the Apostle said, I, I desire the word of his lust to go to heaven. Can't wait to see loved ones that have gone before, friends that I buried, church members that I've loved, kin folks that I've missed. Can't wait. But until then, teach me to wait patiently for the things that you're doing in my life. Some can't wait for a new job. Some can't wait to see their kids grow up and leave home. Some can't wait for a change in their life. To make that change, they've got to wait properly and make the moves that you approve of. Right now, Father, there's somebody in this church that probably needs to make a move before you move. You're waiting on them to say, I'm making Jesus Lord of my life. I'm repenting of my sins. Maybe right here in this church today, somebody's going to say that. Lord, I'm going to give my life to Jesus. You're waiting on me. Now's the time. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Maybe somebody here needs to say, forgive me of my sins. I believe that Jesus died for me and rose again, and I give him my life today. Knowing that in him I'll see all my loved ones again who are in Christ. So save me now as I give my life to Christ. Now make that move to make visible my faith commitment to him in this church today. Jesus name. Amen. Maybe the move you need to make today for God to move is just to come to this altar and say, God, I want to give my life right. Or maybe it was to ask you to come into your heart. I'm going to stand right here and if you want to give your life to Christ, you've never done that. And that's the move he's asking you to make now. Would you make it? God's calling you back to this church. Would you make that move now as well? Let's make the moves. He's asking us to move so he can start moving. Let's stand together. You come. I'll wait for you. You come.